Welcome and thank you all for joining this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. In this show, we cover a broad range of topics that both cater to CRE newcomers and industry leaders alike. I am your host, Taylor Curtis, and today we're thrilled to sit down with Randy Crabtree, co-founder and partner at TriMerit Specialty Tax Professionals. Before we dive in, a little bit about our guest. Randy Crabtree is a widely followed author, lecturer, and podcast host for the accounting profession. Randy is also past president of the Stroke Survivors Empowering Each Other, a 501c3 nonprofit, and partner in an award-winning craft beer and bottle shop in Chicago, Illinois. Since 2019, he has hosted the weekly The Unique CPA podcast, which ranks among the world's 5% most popular programs. You can find articles from Randy in Accounting Today's Voice Column, The AI CPA Tax Advisor, CPA Trendlines, and The Intuit. He's a regular presenter at events around the world. Illinois-based TriMerit is a niche professional services firm that specializes in helping CPAs and their business clients benefit from tax credits and incentives. Many of these incentives have been around for years, yet are often misunderstood or underutilized by taxpayers, leaving money available but unclaimed. Randy's perspective took a sharp turn in 2014 when he suffered from a stroke. The path to recovery led him to refocus on the importance of helping others and incorporating things he was passionate about into everyday life. As co-founder of TriMerit, this meant educating staff, and anyone who would listen on stroke awareness, early detection, and on the simple pleasures in life like craft beer. Randy, welcome to the podcast. Well, Taylor, thank you. And uh, awesome job getting through. That was a long introduction, but <laughs> I, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the words and uh, I appreciate being here. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited to have you. Well, I know we just covered uh, a bit about your background, but I'd love to briefly learn more about your career path and just lessons that you learned along the way. So how did you first get your start in finance and what about taxes in particular interested you as a, as a career path? Wait, how long do we have? I can go on for a while. <laughs> Let me, I'll, give you, I'll give you the semi-short answer and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, but my career as a CPA is not my first career. I actually uh, graduated with a computer science degree a long, long time ago. Um, And so computers has changed. Computer science has changed quite a bit since then. But I was out doing that for a while and realized it wasn't my career path. And uh, um, for me, it was exciting. I thought, you know what? I got to go into sales because that's where all the money is. So I decided sales was for me. It wasn't. I was not great at it. Uh, I en- I enjoyed the people part of it, but it just wasn't a passion for me. And funny thing is, so my this is the this is the short version of the long answer. I was driving home from some sales meeting, and all of a sudden, I had this bright idea. I should have been a CPA, and uh, this was this will tell you how long ago it was. I stopped at a phone booth. I called my <laughs> wife, and I said, "Hey." I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go back to school full time. I'm going to be a CPA. And I'm sure she was in shock. And she was like, okay, uh, why don't we talk when we get home? <laughs> um, but but the thing that got me excited about is I had one accounting class undergrad and I loved it, but it was a dead end accounting class. It was like, you took this one, there was no path forward. And I kind of regretted that. Um, and then after we got married and we'd only been married a, a year at this time, I did our tax return and I'm like, I really enjoyed doing that tax return and it just stuck in that back of my head. So that's what happened. I, I, I quit my job, went back to school for two full semesters plus a summer, got enough hours to take the CPA exam, took the exam and you know, the rest is history. Been doing this now for 35 years. That's awesome. I love that. What um, early lessons were learned that became invaluable in your career now? You know what I think it is? The funny thing is those first two short-term careers taught me a lot, actually. Um, Taught me a lot about just, one, just following your passion. You know, I wasn't passionate. I I, I was good at 
computer programming. I wasn't passionate about it. So it taught me this, that you got to follow your passion. I thought my passion was money and I thought sales was where the money was. <laughs> so that's why I went there. Um, but sales wasn't my passion, but the sales career taught me communication, taught me to you know relate to people, taught me to, to have knowledge about what you're working on so you can share that with others and Today, I teach all the time. That's what I do. I teach on tax credits. I teach on mental health. I teach on corporate culture. I teach on you know firm development, all these things. And so you had to know your, your product when you're in sales. I have to know my topic now when I'm out teaching. And so those, those two things, even though I, I didn't use them directly, the sales or the computer programming or anything, Every step along your career, you learn something that becomes valuable and you don't even know it's going to be valuable later. And so that was so cool. For me, it's it's just don't take anything you're doing for granted because something that you're doing is going to be valuable down the road. Not all of it, but something. And so don't ignore it because there's a chance it's going to help you in the future. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, everything is just a step further in the right direction and a building block. I think about that often too because I'm in a sales role now and um, somewhat early in my career. And I just think back to how much being in sales has shaped me and taught mm-hmm. me how to understand other people's perspective and just how to better communicate with other people. So. Yep. I think that's well, awesome. See, see how much earlier in your career you've learned that than me. That's, that's great. No, <laughs> no, no. Well, do you have any favorite mistakes or I guess like moments that were a course correct that got you onto this path now? Oh man, when there's a there's a story. Yeah. So it's not as much as a mistake. It is a mistake. And this is again a little bit of a long story, but let me go on to this because this is it this impacted me so much in my early career that it's really impacted the way I look at everything out now today. And it's about corporate culture. Um and so when I started my career in public accounting, you know, after those first two short careers. I went to work for a small firm because my goal personally was I was going to go work for somebody for four years and then I was going to start my own business, at my own accounting firm, which, uh, spoiler alert, that's what happened. I actually did it in three and a half years. But um, Hey, that's my question for later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I won't jump ahead. I should have prepared for this, shouldn't I? <laughs> no, no. I'm just teasing. <laughs> we have to laugh. That's, that's a, that, that's a, laughter is huge. Um, so, so I, 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 hopefully I'm not answering another question with this one, but if so, we can edit. <laughs> no, no, take it away. This is just a conversation. All right. So, so two years went out, worked for this firm, loved the people I was working with, loved the firm. The atmosphere was great. Everybody enjoyed being part of it. We put in some long hours, but that was tax season. That's what happens in public accounting. These things we can control about that as well, too. But went there and I was two years in. It was like, okay, I got to go somewhere else now because I need to see another perspective. I got to get another idea of how things are going, what somebody else is doing in their firm. And I went to this other firm and the people there were great. There were some people my age at the time, young uh, people there. And, and, and I enjoyed it, but I did not enjoy the managing partner. And I just, there was, the guy was just this micromanager Um, and, and so that just started to develop this mindset of me that I got to pay attention to what I do. If I am going to go start my own business, I have to understand how I want to treat people. And I can do it from that perspective now, because I am the person that is not running and I'm listening to what someone else is doing. And this is the, this is the story portion of it. I love telling stories, by the way. Um, we were out at a client. It was tax season, so we're working longer hours. We finished the day. I'm with the Manji partner. We finished the day at this client. It was downtown Chicago. And we're leaving this client's office, and it's about a six-block walk back to our office. And I start walking. The Manji partner looks at me and he goes, what are you doing? And he was hailing a cab, a taxi. He was hailing a cab. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm walking back to the office. I need some fresh air. And he looked at me, and I'm not going to swear. He swore. (laughs) He said, get in the effing cab now. And I was just honestly in shock. I'm like, how can somebody 
I'm walking five blocks. I'm going to be there two minutes after you. Um, and so that just, that just kind of, I just wasn't, I just didn't know how to react. And so I was kind of in shock walking around the office that night. We worked a couple more hours at the office. I went home and just was in deep thought all night. What am I going to do? I can't. And I know people put up with a lot worse than I put up with this. And I know there's bad situations, but for me, I, I don't deal with that. And so I'm at home, I'm thinking about it. And I, I come up with a plan. I went into the office the next day, organized my files on my desk, wrote notes on where I was on every project, uh, what needed to be followed up on. Lunchtime, walked out, never went back. <laughs> and so for me, the, what I learned is that you need to treat people like people. You know, mm -hmm. you need to have compassion. You and a lot of you have to allow the people to be who they are, allow them to to do things on the really the outcome is the only important thing. How you get there, I don't care about at all. And so he was he was caring about everything but the outcome. Getting the taxi. We got this time, hours. I everything was based on that and not the work that I was doing, which was in my mind, and I'm sure it was, was awesome. But it was like, okay, we can't <laughs> waste a 30 seconds during tech season. And I was like, this is not it. So that is a long answer. But the early lesson was let people be themselves and let them do yeah. their own thing. The, the results, what matters, not the journey to get to the result. Yeah, it's a great story. I feel, I feel like too, that shows just, I guess, what a pivotal moment it was for you, both in recognizing your personal boundary and saying, you know, I, I don't want to put up with this and I'm going to. I'm going to leave correctly and, and go elsewhere. And then also it, it sounds like that was a big takeaway too, for like how you want to treat other people that you work with in the future. It definitely was. And, and I, I'm very fortunate now I get to go and talk about the importance of creating a good corporate culture, um, all the time now at conferences and events. And, and, uh, um, so it's not the first time I've told that story, but I, yeah. I, I love the impact that it had on me. I didn't hate, I didn't love the situation at the time, yeah. <laughs> but I love the impact that it had on me. So I should really thank him for that because um, <laughs> um, we as a business started Trimerit based on creating a good culture and it's been very successful for us to, to base it on that. Yeah. And then I guess going into more of the background on, on Trimerit, can you help me like understand like what are the primary factors that um, kind of brought the company together um, and made you want to go out and, and build your own company. Yeah, so so Trimerit is the fourth or fifth business that I started since my accounting firm, which was you know a year and a half after I walked out on that. Oh, oh, you know, let me finish that story because there's another aspect yeah. to that story that's pretty cool. Okay, that uh, um, and then I'll answer your question. Uh, and I know you're in charge, but I'm going to no, take no. a pivot here. <laughs> no, no, it's a conversation. <laughs> um, so, so after that, I walked out, no job, newly married. <laughs> I think, <laughs> oh boy, did we had, did we just bought a house too? I think we had our first house at the time too. Yes, we did. And, uh, um, I called the people that I worked for the next day and say, Hey, just wanted to let you know that I left the other job that I took. Their first response was, do you want to come back here? And I'm like, I'll be there tomorrow. And so that was the, the opposite. That was, mm -hmm. you know, a good culture, making friends. And I'm friends with those 30 plus years later. I'm still friends with those people today. Aww. And so, so to me that, that was, uh, that was a huge pivotal moment as well. Just the seeing the opposite end of that, going through what I did two days earlier and then to this company, just saying, come back, Randy, we want you here now. It was pretty cool. Um, That's sweet. But the, the reason I wanted to tell that is because unfortunately a year and a half later then, I did leave again because I started my own firm. And boy, that was the hardest conversation I ever had. I was in tears, um, but I had this opportunity and they understood, which again was so awesome. You know, they, they were, they were happy to see me go, you know, try this next phase of starting the firm myself. And so I started that. I ran that for 16 years. While I had that, I had some other businesses going on. I had a real estate development business, which will tie in, I guess, with uh, some things that uh, you're all doing, but we're developing mixed use uh, um, properties. 
in the Chicago area. And then that kind of wrapped up, and then that's where Trimeric came. And so Trimeric allowed me to use all these other skills that I've learned in every other business, like we were talking about at the beginning. And Trimeric was a place where, where what we do saves money. Everything we do is tax saving opportunities for clients. And so I just got passionate about that rather than you know, I'm doing tax returns and I do everything I could. And I got somebody to a point where they only owned $5,000. And to me, it was a big win. And to them, it was like, I owe $5,000. Wait, can we do anything? <laughs> no, I did yeah. everything. You owed 20 before I did all this stuff. But all they know is I, I owe 5,000. That's all they would hear. Uh, but Trimerit, I get to go in there and I got to say, yeah, we did everything. And now, you know, we give it to your tax preparer and they're going to save you $100,000 in the taxes because of all these opportunities we did. So, that's so, awesome. so that's kind of how I got passionate about Trimerit. Trimerit came out of my transition from real estate development to taking some time off to realizing I probably need to work again <laughs> to deciding I didn't want to work for myself anymore. So I went to work for a firm that was doing R&D tax credits to a month later realizing I can't work for anybody and just saw this opportunity and said, all right, I'm going to go start my own firm. And that's that's really uh, the birth of Trimerit and where it came from. That's awesome. Yeah. Sounds like you're very passionate about it. And you get to be the good guys in your client's eyes, which is Exactly. Great. Yeah. How do you choose your clients or the deals that you work on? That's interesting because it is a... Everything we do is a small part of a tax return. And so when we started Trimerit, and, and I started with Andy Lane, who's an engineer, a lot of the things we do have a technical engineering background, the tax credits and says we work on. I'm the CPA. I got the tax end of things, although I don't do anything with that. I educate on it, but I don't do any of the work. I'm very spoiled. Um, <laughs> um, but for us, the opportunity was not go client by client, the opportunity that makes sense was let's go educate and let's go educate the CPAs, the tax preparers on what these incentives are we're working on. And when we educate them and they see that we're, like you just said, passionate about what we're doing, they see that we have knowledge about what we're doing, they'll end up sending us to their clients. So it was kind of like the the one to many approach. We'll teach you know one accounting firm about this and they'll send us to many clients. And so that's how we started out. It's a slow process because you can't, nobody's going to trust you immediately. I mean, we're talking about very sophisticated tax code and, you know, how do we know you're the expert? How do we know you're the ones that aren't out scamming anybody? Because they're tax scams. Some of them have heard about them right now, probably, because there's stuff in the news. Um, but it was a slow process, but in our mind, it was like, it, that's the way to go. We want to be known as the company that's going to qualify, quantify, document, support on a pace that is going to be defendable. So we started joining CP associations and you don't just join them. They vet you. They, they make sure that you look like you are who you say you are. They wanted us to work with some of their member firms first. And, but then that just started snowballing to the point where, you know, we were, we were the first 10 years, we grew to two and a half million, which is a nice growth. But then the last six years, we've gone from two and a half million to 25 million because that snowball effect and people have seen our, our reputation out there now. Was that your question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was the question. That's incredible. It's a lot of growth too. And you're also the host of your own podcast, The Unique CPA. So what was the catalyst for, for starting that? Let's, let's, I'm, I'm, I'm just, every time you ask a question, I'm like, man, I got another long story. <laughs> I love the stories. Right. <laughs> Keep the stories coming. All right. Um, and so, so you mentioned earlier that I was past president of Stroke Survivors Empowering Each Other. And that's because I had a stroke um, in 2014. So in 2014, I had a stroke and it took me, physically, I recovered very quickly. Mentally, it took me a long time to get past the, you know, the whole, is this going to happen again? Next time something happens, am I going to die? Is this, I mean, and honestly, to the point where I went through you know, like PTSD and anxiety and panic attacks and depression and all this stuff. Well, during that process, I was managing partner of our firm. 
and we were a growing firm. I actually knew we were going to skyrocket too. I knew that was coming. You could, I, it, there was just based things, uh, the way things uh, fell into place. Um, and, and in 2017, three years later, I decided, you know what, I just can't manage this company anymore. I can't be managing partner of this firm. It's just not, I'm, I'm struggling mentally with recovering from the stroke, even though physically I was, I am like the, the perfect stroke survivor from a physical standpoint, no limitations at all, nothing, no deficits. So, I, so I gave up the managing partner role, but then I was trying to define who am I, if I'm not managing partner, what's my role? Just anybody listening. Just because you start a business doesn't mean you have to do everything. And my mindset was I had to do everything. I had to be part of everything. It's if I'm not the face of this company from a managing partner standpoint, what am I? Well, in that process, I realized I just love educating. I love going talking, which you obviously can probably understand now because <laughs> we're doing it. <laughs> and, and love sharing things I've learned over the years that I've learned from others. And uh, after giving up that role, a couple of years later, we had the, uh, a new head of marketing and she came to me and she said, Hey, we're going to start a podcast. I'm like, Oh, that's great. You're going to host it. What? I'm not hosting a podcast. What are you talking about? And, and they started talking to me about it. And I go, okay, if I'm hosting a podcast, we're not talking about tax credits and incentives every <laughs> single episode. Cause who's going to listen to that? I'm not listening to that. And I love tax credits and incentives. And so the more I thought about it, it's like, I've met so many interesting people in this profession that are doing so many interesting and cool things to, to you know, whatever, the, make the profession better, to be more efficient, to, to be, have better work-life balance. So I, I finally said, all right, I'll do this. But the only way I'm doing it is if we highlight all these cool things that everybody else is doing and learn from them. And then everybody's like, yeah, that sounds great. So we ran with it. And uh First couple of years, we were bi-weekly, um, and now we've decided to go weekly. I honestly have about seven months of recordings done right now, which is crazy. And so wow. I think we might start going twice a week now, but I, I'm at conferences constantly. I see all these people doing these cool things. And I'm like, we got to talk about that on the podcast. Everybody has to hear what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start sharing this. And so for me, it's just become another form of education, helping if my kind of my mantra is to to make our profession better. And if I could do that by sharing everybody else's knowledge, that's something that I'm passionate about. That's awesome. Yeah. Sounds like you really dove into that and, and really like it. What are some surprising things you've learned uh, in creating educational content on the podcast? So every guest teaches me something. And so when I started the podcast, my, my audience, not audience from a podcast standpoint, but my audience from a going out talking about tax credits and incentives was mainly large CPA firms, the, the top 400 largest CPA firms, which they're great, um, but they're not as nimble as these smaller firms can be in these startup firms. And so early on, the very third episode I ever did, the second episode was great. He was a larger firm, but he tore that firm down. They were, they were, they were a $20 million firm. He became managing partner. He tore it down. And overnight, they became a $14 million firm and then restructured it to base it on a, a corporate culture that where their employees and families could thrive. That was the concept. We want to create an environment where our employees and their families can thrive. Nothing about clients, nothing about how they're doing anything. And that was just like, wow, that's not what I've seen before. Everybody's kind of like nose to the grindstone and let's worry about the client and get them to work out and how many billable hours. And then the third episode was this gentleman that started a startup firm 15 years ago now, fully remote. I, mean, I never even heard of fully remote when I was, that was pre-pandemic and they were fully remote and they were not billing by the hour, which everybody in accounting was always billing by the hour and they were doing value-based billing or subscription pricing. And, and, and then they had a niche practice. So it was only a couple industries. And so just this whole different mindset that I saw people doing and creating these very profitable firms, that person that tore down the firm. 20 million overnight to 14 million um, had partners leave, had employees leave, 
But today they're $55 million. They're one of the 100 largest CPA firms in the country, and they are socially and fiscally responsible. They're a B corporation. They value their employees. They they only take on clients where they have passionate leaders for that industry segment they're working on. So I just learned this whole new way of building an accounting practice or building a business in general, not even accounting, just a business in general that I would never would have seen if I didn't start the podcast. And that that was the surprising thing to me, that there was different ways to do things that I never even thought of before. Yeah, that's so cool. How What a full circle moment too, because it sounds like you've gotten a chance to meet so many incredible individuals and get excited to help put their story out there and help influence others. And then while doing that on the podcast too, there's so many takeaways that you've been able to bring back to your business. Yeah, it, it, it's for sure that. And and I'm going to go on another tangent here for a second, because what you just said, it's a, it's a lot. I've learned and met so many cool people. I actually uh, started a conference this year called Bridging the Gap Conference. And the Bridging the Gap Conference is about that. Let's share all these really cool stories. Let's take what we've learned on the podcast and let's expand it into an in-live, in-person event where well, then we all get to hang out together and just have a community building, but also share our knowledge. And, and when you put on a conference, especially for the first time, so I don't get nervous. I don't get anxiety or anything like that anymore. I learned when I was going through this my stroke, I never want to have that again. The conference did that a little uh, because <laughs> you put this together and you, your thought process is, is this ever going to live up to my expectations? How can it possibly live up to my expectations? And about three weeks before the conference, I just said, Randy, let it go. It's going to do what it, it does. You've, you've invited everybody you want. You've got the people there. And it ended up being, and, and it's something like I'm bragging now, but if you look at social media, it was the greatest conference in the history of the accounting profession. I mean, and it was the community Aww. aspect of it. Mm -hmm. and, and so now we've already planned year two. People are coming to me nonstop. When is it? I want registration. We want a sponsor. And so that anxiety that a little bit I had will not happen this year, but it was just so cool to uh, to see that that people are, they want to learn different ways to do things, to be more efficient, to have better work-life balance, to be more profitable by working less hours, uh, to value the people that you're working with. All right. I do not remember your question. <laughs> no, no. I, I love the tangent. Um, congratulations, too. I'm glad it was such a hit. Yep. I'm excited to hear how the, the second year goes, too. Thank you. You've brought up a couple of times um, the stroke and just how that's shaped you and how there is even a little bit of like anxiety, PTSD um, surrounding that. If you feel comfortable, can you share with the listeners um, how you were able to turn that event into such a positive and how you were able to bring that into what you're doing now? Yeah, so I one of my most asked for presentations is about burnout. And burnout to me is a mental health event. It's not technically defined as a mental illness, but it is being pushed to uh, to get that defined as a mental illness because I think it is. And so our profession, but really almost every entrepreneur, every professional at some level is going to deal with burnout. And I want to help people avoid that. In fact, I'm talking at a construction uh, conference in January. They specifically reached out to me and say, Randy, we've heard you talk about burnout and can you come and do it for our profession? So it's not just the accounting profession. And so what I do is I relate that the triggers that could potentially cause burnout as a professional to the triggers that were affecting me from a, you know, a, a mental illness. And for the longest time, I never even said I had depression. I never even said that, uh, that I went through mental illness, which depression is, what I would say is I used to have these melancholy feelings where I was, uh, where I was, you know, just not right. Um, and the problem is there's too many people that are going through the melancholy feelings or the burnout or the depression or the anxiety. And so what I've now done, the, the journey that I went through, which I went through this it was a five-year process, so it wasn't an overnight fix. 
I wouldn't change it because it's put me where I am now, which is, I, I feel very guilty to say this because there's so many people dealing with depression right now. And it's like, well, I don't want them to go through this. So how could I say I would want to go through it again? But, but what I did was, you know, I took this, I did multiple things. One, don't hide the fact that you're going through something. Share it with somebody because you're not the only one. And every time I do this presentation, I just did it two days ago in Las Vegas at a, at a large conference. I had 10 people immediately come up to me afterwards to share their story. Um, so vulnerability is a big aspect to this. If I'm going to be vulnerable and share my story, I think that helps people realize what we don't have to stigmatize mental health. We don't have to stigmatize, you know, burnout or, or uncontrolled uh, um, stress that we might be going through because there's something we can do about it. So I, I kind of share my story of, yes, I was going through this and it became to a point where I was feeling hopeless and, and honestly it got to a point where I didn't know what my brain was going to tell me. And I was afraid it was going to tell me life wasn't worth living. And that scared me so much that I said, I got to go get help. I can't do this. And as a CPA, that's hard to admit because our thing is we help everybody. And so for me to admit, I need the help. I can't do this on my own. I want people to realize that's not weakness. That's just, you need this. And so I went and I saw some counselors and I, uh, you know, I saw the first counselor who basically, she was great, but told me that I can't control it. So don't worry about it. And that's, you just heard, that's not my mindset. My mindset is I can't control it. Uh, by the third time I got to the third counselor, she did something magic. I don't know what, but uh, I was uh, in my, uh, my melancholy place at home after one of our sessions, realizing that I could make the decisions. My brain wasn't in charge anymore. I was going to take back control of my brain. So I stood in the mirror, I stood up, looked in the mirror and I, I actually was mad. I was, I yelled at my brain. It was, my brain was, when you're, when you're going through a depression, there's a separate entity that's, you're not in control anymore. It takes over every aspect of your life. And it wasn't nonstop. It was up and down. But I looked at my brain and I'm not going to swear, but, and I don't normally swear. I swore that day. And this is the second time I've said I don't swear. So, but that day I swore and I looked at my brain and I said, F you. You're not real. Get out of my head. I am not listening to you anymore. And I just said that about eight times in a row. And I just, and again, five-year process. So this is not an overnight fix, uh, but, but I just started to feel better. And then over the next two or three weeks, it went away. And then I realized, you know what? I need to start talking about this. I need to share this. And then what, that was another year and a half before I started to share all this stuff with other people. Um, but but I, it was like, okay, I think there's something here. There's too many people struggling. If I can help make a difference, every single time I do the presentation, I cry. People in the audience are crying. But I also give concrete steps that we can do to help us get through this. So, so for me, the stroke, honestly, and it's, again, I feel guilty saying this, but the stroke was a blessing for me because it changed my whole outlook to everything. And it's put me in a position now where I'm able to at least be vulnerable, share my story, and hopefully have a small impact on, on what's going on in the world. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I can imagine this is going to resonate with so many of our listeners too. Um, but, you know, I think in today's culture, the grind gets so glamorized and pushing yourself and having a million different side hustles. And, and sometimes it can be really hard to see everybody else around yes. um, doing so much and people put so much pressure on themselves too. So I, I think the, the burnout, I think mental health, all of that is so prevalent and it's great that people like you are sharing this more and more and it's becoming a, uh, more of a conversation topic and less stigmatized You're with right. each year. Yeah. Cause I, I think so many people go through it too. And um, you know, I, again, I really appreciate you sharing your story because it's a hard thing to go through. It's a hard thing to accept what you're going through. And it's even harder to talk about to your family, to your friends, and then let alone publicly too. And, um, you know, it's, it, it sounds like it was a, a scary time, a dark time, and it can be hard to like, want to revisit that too. So I appreciate you 
being very open about that yep. and helping other people realize that it's okay and that there are steps to take too. Yep. And that's in the, in the presentation, I go through the steps. Can I tell another story just to show how yes, this- Yes, I would love how, to. <laughs> so so how this it. can impact, because you know, I think I just gave you a short version of things I talk about, but the vulnerability is the key thing. If, if And you just said, it, it's being less stigmatized. People are willing to sh talk about it now. I think the pandemic accelerated that too, um, which I, if there was anything good, and there's not good with pandemic, but from that standpoint, people were more open to share their feelings, that they were feeling isolated, that they were going through things. Um, this, this story is um, one of the things that I do mentally to recharge, because I'm nonstop May through mid-December. I'm on the road. I travel constantly. I love it. But there's times where I need to slow down a little bit. And I recognize that. And that happened this fall. I would recognize a few times where, okay, this is too much. I'll cut a day, two days off of a trip and just go home early. Um, you know, if my speaking events done, I don't need to stay at the conference. I can leave. Even though I love hanging out with the people, I can leave. Well, another thing I do is in January, February, March, um, I don't travel at all for the most part. Um, my wife and I, we head out of town, head out of Chicago for the winter, and we just go to warm weather and relax and I recharge. Now, again, I'm spoiled. I know I'm spoiled. Not everybody can do that. Um, but last January, a CPA firm asked me to come out, who had, the managing partner had saw my presentation on burnout. He asked me to come out and uh, do the presentation for the entire firm. And this is a large firm, you know, top 200 firm probably. So, the, you know, you know, hundreds of employees. And uh, I said, you know what? I think it's important. He wanted me to do this before tax season so people can get the right mindset of, you know, how to avoid burnout during tax season. And, and so I go, and a big part of the presentation is me talking about what I went through with the stroke and how I recovered and how, you know, we can avoid getting to that point. And two months later, the C or four months later, the CPA emailed me and said, Randy, I just want to thank you. Oh, back up a second. At the end of that presentation, that managing partner of that CPA firm, big CPA firm, and, and a big guy too, he comes up, stands next to me, said, Randy, you know, I just want to thank you so much for being here and, and, and being vulnerable and sharing your story. And then he starts to be vulnerable. And he shares a story of his family dealing with depression. And, and you know, the tears are starting on him. The tears are starting on me. You look in the audience, the tears are starting on everybody. But the impact that he had on that audience, I'm looking out there, and I just feel like the relationship changed there. They realize that, yes, this isn't something that has to hide in the corner. I don't have to power through something that is in quotes, a weakness to, in other people's eyes because he's willing to share. And now I know his door's open and I can go talk about anything. Well, four months later, he emailed me and again, thanked me, said, Randy, I just want you to know, before you came out here, I just had this sense I really needed to hear everything that you were saying that day. It just, it's just something I had this sense. And I want to let you know, two weeks ago, I had a stroke. And this is what he said. Everything that you told us you went through, all those pitfalls and all those, you know, going down this path, I'm recognizing that in me, but I know what to do about it now because you were out here sharing that. And I just want to thank you for that. And so just, that's that's why I can't stress enough the vulnerability. You'll never know who you're going to affect. If you have a story, share it because that's going to help someone else down the road. Yeah, it's incredible. It sounds like the ripple effect too. You were able to help him and now he was able to help all of his employees too by opening the door. Yep. Yep. Am I going down way too many tangents, Taylor? <laughs> you just get me back on track, which... Uh, good no, luck I doing it. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I could chat with you all day. I love all the stories. <laughs> all right. Do you have any uh, like daily habits or practices that you like to build in? I know you mentioned it's you know it it, it was a five year process to get to where you are now. But are there are there any I guess quick little tips and tricks that you would give to the audience? I heard the word quick there. No. <laughs> Randy, don't go on too long. <laughs> I wasn't applying anything. Don't worry. <laughs> hey, I like to have fun, so don't worry. Um, hey, I could sit here all day. <laughs> so the, the, from a quick standpoint, uh, let me give you a simple, a couple simple ones. Your brain 
needs to be refreshed, recharged. It needs time off. And if it's just 15 minutes here or there, you give it 15 minutes. You can't sit at your desk and work nonstop. And so like you heard earlier, I'm on the road a lot. But when I am home, and when I'm on the road, I do this too, but when I'm at home, it's on my calendar that my wife and I go for a walk at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. We take 15 minutes. We just, wherever we were, we'll make notes and let sure you remember where we are because, you know, getting distracted and restarting takes a lot of time away and brain work away. So leave yourself a note where you were and you come back and you can start up again. So we just go walk, leave the phone behind, don't talk about anything with work and just refresh. So that's something that people think, I can't do that. I got too much work. My to-do list is forever. Believe me, you're going to be more efficient just by giving your brain those types of rest. Don't eat at your desk. Get away. Do a little meditation. Um, and then one bigger tip, and I can go into a bunch of these, but let me give you one bigger tip. Because we're all on, and it depends on your profession. Sometimes you have to be on a little bit longer than others, but we're all on 24-7. It's what we do. It's just so easy to check your email at 8 o'clock at night. It's just so easy to return a text message about business or Teams message or a Slack message or a what's up, what's that mess. I mean, all these different places we can get bombarded from. And so I have a friend of mine, uh, Brian Cush, who, who told me this, what he does and what he teaches other people to do is learn how to shut off at the end of the day. And for us to avoid burnout and, and, and God forbid, further down the path than burnout to depression or whatever else, I think this is really important. And there's a three-step process to shut off at the end of the day. One, when, you, when your day's over, whatever it is, everybody's got different schedules, but whatever your day ends, make it end. So bookmark your work. Tell your, tell your morning self where your evening self left off. So, you know, it could be most likely the best place is if you're working with a computer, put it on, you know, your a Word document or something on your computer. So when you open your computer, it's there. Be consistent, have it in the same place. So you're not searching for it. You don't have to try to think, where did I leave that? You want consistency. So you tell yourself where you left off. So you don't, in the morning, boom, you get right to it. Two, you become, you come up with, he calls an instead of plan. So instead of checking my email at eight o'clock tonight or returning messages, which actually sets a terrible example for people you work with, because now they think, oh, I have to be on 24 seven because Randy's on all the time or Taylor's on all the time. And she sent a message at nine o'clock at night. So now I have to make sure I check them all the time. And ha having an instead of plan that says, instead of work tonight, I'm going to go home and read a book. I'm going to go to a movie. I'm going to work out. I'm going to do a puzzle. Just have something that you know you're going to do when you leave the office or wherever you work, the job site, the, the whatever. And then number three, uh, you bookmark, you have an instead of plan, you have a, a, a ritual to closing down, mental and physical. It could be as easy as closing your computer, but training your brain that day's over. Look, I closed my computer, day's over. It can be, uh, um, you know, doing a jumping jack, a push up, the physical thing, and then mental. You know, you know, say a poem, uh, recite a, uh, uh, you know, say a prayer, uh, do a meditation, do something that is also, you know, uh, an indication that the day is over. So physical and mental shutdown, you do that, you do it consistently. You've now just trained your brain, but it's over. Day's over. I'm not going to wake up at three in the morning thinking about what I need to work on tomorrow because you already know you told yourself that. And so you just start to get this better rest rejuvenation. You're going to start sleeping through the nights and you're going to have less stress and anxiety because you, you, you know what you're working on. That's a, a more in-depth one. And I got more of those in-depth ones, but that one I, I love because we can all do that. Yep. Absolutely. Just being mindful to build in those boundaries. Yep. Yeah. You got it. Well, diving into our topic for today, um, would love to learn <laughs> Finally. more about... <laughs> Sorry, I've just been chatting your ear off. <laughs> well, we would love to learn more about hidden tax opportunities and advantages in commercial real estate. So can you give us a high level overview on the most commonly used or commonly known tax incentives in the CRE sector? Yeah, let me, I'll give you a couple and I'll go through them fast. And if you want me to expand on any, we can. So the most common one, and this has been around forever, is just cost segregation. So if we are investing in commercial real estate, 
Uh, there's a way to write off those properties quicker by looking at components within those properties and see what we can depreciate, write off, deduct on our tax return at a quicker rate. Because commercial real estate in general is written off over 39 years. But what we do with CostSeg, we can go in there and look at, okay, you've got these drop ceilings. That's not a 39-year write-off. That's a you know five or seven-year write-off. You have You've you've got you know movable wall that's written off quicker, and so typically we can find assets inside of a commercial building that you could write off, you know, you know thirty, forty, fifty percent of them in a shorter time frame than uh, than the thirty nine year because you write it off something over thirty nine years you don't feel the impact of that deduction that much if you write it off over one five seven years the impact is it's much greater on the tax return so from a commercial real estate Either I'm building and owning or I'm buying. Um, those are the, that's a really easy one to look at from a, a valuation. Interesting. Uh, yep. Yeah. Some and other for, ones. For our listeners yeah, too, where I guess this is a newer topic for them and um, admittedly myself too, can you touch on different parts of the transaction process and, and just on the, the options in those different type of assets? Yeah, and so so from a depreciation standpoint, you have five, seven, fifteen, and thirty-nine year property mainly, and, and so it's just us identifying the right categories for property. Usually, people invest in a building, buy a building, build a building, build a commercial real estate, and and they write it off over thirty-nine years. So so the transaction of figuring this out is you hire somebody like us. We go in, we do an engineering study, we identify the properties that are written off quicker. Um, and then we give it to your tax preparer and they, you know, take advantage of the quicker write-offs. Um, it's, it's, it's anybody that builds, anybody that buys, anybody that inherits, anybody that expands, uh, uh, um, remodels, anything with commercial real estate. Basically, anything you do to it, there's an opportunity to look at the analysis to see if it, it's written off uh, quicker. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is what it is, it's just tax savings. If I can write $100,000 off today compared to writing $100,000 off over 39 years, you know, and, and getting, you know, 2200 a year or whatever it is as a deduction, the $100,000 today is much more valuable asset for me to have than this longer write-off. And so that's, that's the reason for it. That's the benefit of, of taking a look at this. Makes sense. What are some, I guess, uncommon or maybe just untapped tax credits or incentives that are available now in the commercial real estate industry? So for commercial real estate, the one that is is going to be the hot topic going forward, and this is pretty much brand new, and this really kicked in January 1st of 23. So we haven't even seen anybody take advantage of this because the first tax returns will be filed um, beginning of 24, 24 file, tax filing season, are renewable energy tax credits. And, and this is something that Congress defined at the end of 22. And it's anybody that is, you know, from a commercial real estate standpoint, there's a multiple things, but most common is going to be, we have a commercial real estate property and we're going to use renewable energy. So we put solar panels on it. We use wind uh, 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 energy or um, there's these electrochromatic windows that you can replace on a commercial building that actually generate uh, energy for that building. All of these things that go into that, the cost of that can be available for a tax credit. And the credit, it starts at 6%. It's really easy to get to a 30% credit. And a tax credit is a dollar for dollar tax savings. When I was talking cost segregation, that's a deduction. If I have a $100,000 deduction and I'm in a 30% tax bracket, I save $30,000. If I have a $100,000 tax credit, I save $100,000. So credit is more valuable than a deduction, but they're both valuable. In this scenario, if we're, I'll do use a real ex simple example. I've, I've got a commercial building. I put solar panels on it. I invest $200,000 into the solar panels probably at a minimum, I'm going to get a 30% credit. That means I'm going to save $60,000, 30% of the $200,000. i am going to save $60,000 on my tax return today. 
I'm also going to write off that 200,000. So I'm probably going to save another, you know, if I'm in a, a let's say I'm in a 30% bracket, I'm going to save another $60,000. So I'm going to save $120,000 of my $200,000 investment immediately. I'm going to recoup during, during tax savings. And now I'm not going to pay the utility company for energy anymore because I'm self-producing and using it. And so the 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 break even point on that investment or the 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 return on investment has come down or the return's gone up so much the break even point come down so much that by doing that I could recoup all my money in the next 3 to 5 years and after that I just have all free additional money coming in cuz I'm not paying the utility companies anymore. You're going to see a ton of this happening over the next 10 years because the incentives are so great. These incentives are new. Mm-hmm. They're so great that the cost of doing this has come down so far that you're even going to see nonprofits, you, churches that don't pay tax or any kind of tax-exempt entity can actually do this too because that becomes a refundable credit for them. And I know I'm talking tax jargon that's, uh, you know, I know it's very exciting to listen to. No, please keep <laughs> going, please. Um, but but so this credit, they Congress made this so user-friendly. If you're a nonprofit, you turn it into a tax payment, it becomes a refundable credit. So nonprofits get a tax refundable credit and they don't pay tax. So this has never been the case for a tax exempt entity that turns something into a tax credit. Um, If you're a for-profit business and you're paying tax, you can offset the tax. You can go back three years and offset the tax and probably recoup all that investment now. And if you're a for-profit business that doesn't pay tax today, which a lot of commercial real estate may not, just because of the depreciation they have already, you can sell the credit. You know, you have a hundred thousand dollar credit. You could probably sell it for ninety thousand dollars. You get ninety thousand dollars cash in your pocket today, and the the entity that bought it is going to go save ten thousand dollars on their taxes, so they're happy too. So that's why this is going to skyrocket. These renewable energy tax credits are going to go through the roof over the next couple of years and over the next ten years for sure. Wow, how interesting. Yep. Thanks for diving into that too. Yep. Yeah, it's fun. Can you talk a little bit about the Inflation Reduction Act too? Yep. And that's where this was defined is in the Inflation okay. Reduction Act. So the, these were all defined in there. There's other incentives. You know, if you have, you know, manufacturers right now that own their commercial property, um, there's specific credits for them that were in the Inflation Reduction Act that if they're manufacturing products that make renewable energy, there's a specific credit for them. If they manufacture components that go into the products that make renewable energy, there's a specific credit for them. If they're trying to reduce greenhouse effects on their building, there's a specific credit for them. If they're expanding their property to uh, help them manufacture or recycle components and and minerals that go into renewable energy, there's a credit for them. All of these things were defined in the Inflation Reduction Act. So there's so many opportunities out there through what just was defined that nobody really knows about yet because they're not going to kick in to or the next tax return we file. But just to give you an idea, this is gigantic from a from an opportunity standpoint for taxpayers. Oh, I get passionate about this. This is a gigantic. Um I deal with the research and development tax credit, which is a great opportunity for tax for manufacturers and software developers. That's projected to be a hundred billion dollar tax savings for taxpayers over the next 10 years, hundred billion. That's a big deal. This renewable energy tax credit and everything I just mentioned is projected Mm -hmm. to be over 1 trillion, over 10 times the R and D tax credit opportunity for taxpayers over the next 10 years. So it's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a no brainer, but are there any cons to it? Or I guess what sort of trends to are you so, going to... Yeah. What I'm going to say from a con standpoint is anytime there's something like this where there's opportunity for tax savings, and we just all saw it with the employee retention credit, there's, there's and I don't know how familiar you are with that, but there's people out there promoting that and doing it wrong. You've got to make sure if you're looking at this, you're dealing with somebody reputable but that knows the credit, knows what qualifies because you know you could be promised anything. So obviously go to your tax advisor, talk to them, make sure that this is this is right for you and they'll have your back on this. Uh, um, 
because you don't want to get caught in a situation where you're being scammed. And unfortunately, anytime there's tax saving opportunities, somebody's going to try to scam you. And that's the only con because in reality, this is such a huge opportunity, but make sure you do a full analysis or somebody you trust looks at it for you. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Sounds like the only con other than that too, is just not diving into it sooner. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, you know, there is an upfront investment. And so you're not going to recoup all that immediately. So Mm -hmm. you need to be aware of that. But over, look, do a a return on investment analysis, have somebody in the financial industry do that with you. And if it looks like, hey, I can, you know, get this, all this money back in the next five years, it's going to be very tempting to, to take a look at that. Oh, yeah. What are some common challenges or pitfalls that you see your clients face? And I guess with that too, like how would you typically advise them through it? Yeah, with specifically renewable energy or just tax credits and incentives in general is probably a better way to go, I suppose. Um, One, if you're looking at tax credits and incentives, make sure they're usable. You know, cost segregation that we talked about. If you're already in a loss situation, which oftentimes if you own commercial property, you're not tax purposes in a profitable situation because there's so much depreciation already. Don't have somebody come out and tell you, let's do a cost seg when you're not going to use it today. Um, you know, it, you want it to be tax savings today. If it's going to be tax savings 10 years down the road with like cost segregation, you can wait 10 years down the road and then accelerate those costs at that point in time. Same thing with what I just mentioned, the employee retention credit. There's, if you're in the commercial real estate uh, uh, industry, you probably don't qualify for it. And I'll guarantee you there's companies out there telling you, you all qualify for it. Don't get scammed for something like that. Be aware of that. Um, make sure you're working with somebody that knows you know, the tax code inside and out. And I'm not saying you can be a one person shop that knows it well. But just make sure that uh, that whoever you're working with is is educated. Just don't pick a tax preparer because it's your uh, sister's best friend or you know something like that. Make sure that they know your your industry. And that's the other thing. Make sure they're industry specific. If you're dealing with somebody that doesn't know commercial real estate, I, there are so many people who niche their practices and their experts in commercial real estate, that that's just, they're going to be, have so much more advice available to you that I think make sure that they're somebody that specializes in whatever profession you're in. Those are probably mm-hmm. some of the key things. Makes sense. Do you have any favorite deals that your team has worked on that you'd be open to sharing with the audience? I actually do. And, and it's not necessarily commercial real estate, but I have, you know, everything we do, helps people. It puts money back into their business. And I said this a couple of times already. I mentioned employee retention credit. We did a lot of these. We do it legit. We don't, we're not, we're doing the ones that are accurate. And, and one of the first clients that we worked on to help them save money, this, this was a, this was a pandemic related, you know, incentive out there, COVID related incentive. And it also helped nonprofits too. So nonprofits could take advantage of this credit. One of the very first clients that we worked on was a, a company that supported children with autism. And they were financially hurt by the pandemic because they got their money going out to schools and supporting the kids with autism in the schools and having programs for them. And the schools were all closed. So their revenue dried up. We were able to figure out that they incl- they qualify for the employee retention credit. I think we put about $300,000 of cash back into that business, into that nonprofit that helped them get through the pandemic and thrive and put new programs in place to help these kids who were suffering. And these kids needed that help and, and, and they didn't have any. And so they were able to put new programs in place to help them get through the point in time where they couldn't be in person. I think that was the most satisfying deal that I've ever worked on. Aww. Yeah, what what a story and what an impact too. Yep. That's incredible. Thanks for sharing that one. I know you mentioned too just how much this is going to take off in the industry in the next five to 10 years. Yep. How do you think it's also going to impact the landscape of who is entering or driving activity in the sector? 
Yeah, so from this standpoint, you're going to see a lot of investment in commercial real estate. And I'm not that we have to talk about that, but the, because the the what's going to happen is, I, you already saw it. So there was a new commercial building that's being built in Nevada right now. And I think I got my story straight. And it's a $100 billion investment in this property, brand new commercial property that the property is being put in place to figure out ways and to do the process of recycling critical minerals that go into electric vehicle batteries. And so right now what they're doing is R and D on these batteries, figuring out how they can recycle all the equipment. Cause it, it, they, there's in, there's, you know, if these batteries wear out, what do we do with them? We throw them in a landfill? No, that's not what we want. The incentives are to figure out ways to, to recycle. And so for this plant, they've already figured out how to recycle about 90% of the materials in there. I'm guessing it's going to go up. But that billion dollar investment in this plant, my guess is probably at a minimum was a 50% credit. Some of these credits that I said are 30% can go as high as 70%. I'm guessing they were smart enough to put this in an area where they get up to a 70% credit. If that's the case, there's a seven hundred thousand or seven hundred million dollar tax credit coming back to them of their billion dollar investment, and now they're also a manufacturer facility, so there's an R and D tax credit. So you're just going to see all this new facilities um, being built or remodeled to take advantage of credit. So I think the construction profession in general is really going to get a bump because of these new incentives and manufacturing sector as well because of all of the uh, credits that are available to them about renewable energy. So there's going to, and there's going to be things that I'm not even thinking about, but we're going to see more commercial real estate. We're going to see more construction and we're going to see more manufacturing. Those, I think are three areas where we're going to, we're going to see a lot of a positive hit from these incentives. Interesting. And then you mentioned too, when it first came out or that it's a newer, um, kind of initiative out there. You mentioned that a lot of people aren't aware of it. Why do you think that is? Uh, because we're still, so in, in the tax world, people live a year behind. Um, and so this doesn't kick in until 24, even though it started January of 23, you're not going to see the benefit until April of 24. And so people aren't thinking about it. Now, you know, our sophisticated tax advisors that are talking to their clients before the end of the year, they're asking these questions now of just, did you do any of this? Did you remodel your building? Did you, you know, whatever the questions are. And as two things, as that starts happening and as these solar companies and, and wind companies start educating people on the return on investment that's going into their products, you're just going to see this more. And so we're, we're at the, we're at the point where we're at the bottom of the hockey stick, but on an upslope and we're a couple of years away from going straight up that hockey stick where the, the growth is going to be gigantic. Interesting. And I can imagine too, we'll hear about it on your podcast maybe. So yes, I don't talk. That's the thing. I don't talk about tax credits that much on the podcast. We will. I'm sure because this is honestly right before you and I recorded today, I was on a uh, webinar I was giving for, I think they're a top 100 CPA firm, where the only topic we touched on was the renewable energy tax credit opportunities. And so now going into this tax season, the, 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 the uh, uh, tax professionals are getting educated on it and that'll be out there. So I probably will put it on one of the podcasts just so they know. Awesome. Well, we'd love to ask you a few rapid fire or words of advice type questions if you're up for it. Yes, I'm up for it. All right. So the first one, if you were given $50 million today and had to invest it immediately, what would your go-to asset type and location be and why? Well, first, can I see the 50 million? <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, based on what I was just saying... I mean, why wouldn't I, you know, build some kind of commercial real estate property where I can recoup as high as seventy percent of that fifty million dollar investment immediately through tax credits? So, I mean, I guess that was almost a no brainer answer to this. Now, would I throw all fifty into it? I'm I'm more conservative than that, so I'd probably put it elsewhere. But that that I think is going to be a a great investment going forward. Yep, work smarter, not harder. Yep. <laughs> Cool. Well, what would be your most recommended book 
for peers or young professionals? So I have, and the funny thing is, I'm not a huge business book reader. I probably should be because I people talk to me about all these different business books like, you know, Jim Collins, Good to Great, which I'm starting to read now. Um, and, 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 and I'm very happy with it. Uh, Simon Sinek's book, The Infinite Game. I think you have to read that. I think that's an awesome, awesome book. I, I would recommend that to anybody. But I'm not if I had. So I was going to say if I have to pick one, but obviously I didn't because I already listed <laughs> a couple more. <laughs> Uh, my favorite book, and, and probably none of you have heard about it, but it's won a lot of awards, and it's it's a, f- a friend of mine. I became friends with him after he wrote it, uh, but it's called What's Your And? And what your and is, you know, hey, we're, we're all, you know, we're a real estate professional. We're a CPA. We're a, you know, uh, uh, work in the construction profession. We're a doctor. That's what we do, but that's not who we are. Our and is who we are. I'm a CPA, but I'm a craft beer enthusiast. I'm a CPA, but I, I love hiking. I love traveling. I love family. I love sports. All those are my ands. My ands is what defines me. And so I I can't stress enough how important it is to be able to share your ands in your profession too. And so I reading this book will show you how important it is to allow the people you work with to be their whole selves at work not just their job title. And I think that book's had a bigger impact on me than any other thing I've done in my life, reading wise. And so John Garrett, what's your and? Can we hear a little bit more about your and too with the craft beer? Yeah, so I, I, uh, this was, I've been a craft beer enthusiast for quite a while. In fact, you know, I'm 61 years old now. Even in college, craft beer wasn't a thing, but it was like you had... Michelob, which was, you know, considered the higher beer than, you know, old style or something like that, or, or St. Pauli or some Belgian beers or Canadian beers. And so I always liked that better, but I didn't realize that there was a, that was making me a craft beer enthusiast. About 15 years ago, when I was, I, you know, travel a lot, you heard that earlier, I was just seeing these breweries, little breweries pop up around the country and I'd go try them and I'm like, wow, this is cool. They're making some really interesting beers. And then, then when I had my stroke, one of the things I did was I walked constantly after my stroke. It was like, you know, I was obsessed with, with keeping myself in shape. I was obsessed with everything. And, but one of the things I did to, when I walked nonstop was listen to craft beer podcasts. And, um, and one of the craft beer podcasts was called the, uh, uh, the, uh, beer temple Wait, what was it called? My mind's blank now. I think the the Beer Temple podcast. And the Beer Temple podcast is run by Chris Quinn. And Chris and I ended up meeting each other after I listened to 500 of his podcast. And we hit it off. And he was about to open a craft beer bar. And he asked me to be his partner. It's a longer story oh, than that. Cool. Bottom line is I partnered up with him. We opened up the Beer Temple craft beer bar, also a craft beer store. And as of this past June, we opened up a restaurant as well. And so uh, my passion, uh, my and of craft beer has also turned into a, a passion project with a, with a business as well. I love that. What don't you do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't work. <laughs> I, just, I just talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that. I love your outlook on everything too. It's been well, a real pleasure. Well, thank you. I've had as fun. We- I'm sorry. Uh, no, no. I was just going to say, as we wrap up, do you have any parting words that you'd like to share with our audience? I think one of the biggest things that I've learned over the years is just follow your passion. And and if you don't, if 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 not necessarily, it doesn't mean what you're doing now isn't your passion. But there's probably something you're doing within what you're doing that you're more passionate about. Follow that path, because you're not going to feel like I don't feel like I work a day in my life. And this took me a long time to realize. I, I worked a lot of days till the last you know six <laughs> years. Now I don't. It's just fun. So if you can find something that you really enjoy, and hopefully it's within what you're doing currently, and I'll guarantee you there's something there you enjoy, follow that. And if there's things you don't enjoy, I'll tell you this, there's nothing you can't outsource. I mean, we're in a gig economy. If you don't like filling out paperwork, 
hire someone to fill out the paperwork because then you can concentrate on the things you're passionate about. So, so if I could give any piece of advice is just follow your passion and the things that make you smile. Love that. Well, thank you so much. It's been an awesome time to sit down and chat with you. We really appreciate you sharing your insights. I know you're really busy. So thank you for the time. And for people that want to find you afterwards, how can they stay in touch? Yeah, it's a, um, probably a couple places. LinkedIn, uh, our marketing department, um, you know, puts me all over LinkedIn. Um, and so I'm there, just Randy Crabtree on LinkedIn. You'll probably find me. But our website, which is a try T R I dash merit M E R I T dot com. They'll have a meet the team page there. If you need to, you know, find my email address or see anything else about what we're doing, uh, try dash merit dot com is probably the best place. Awesome. Well, thank you to everybody who tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, do not miss the next one. Visit go dot dot com slash podcast and sign up to get the next episode delivered straight to your inbox. And of course, you can always subscribe to the Crexy podcast on your favorite app and check out our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care and be sure to tune in next time.